which supporting actress nominee from Doubt gave the performance most worthy of an Oscar win? Hey, it's Michael, AKA Oscar Man. And to date, a whopping 22 films boasted two nominations in the Best Supporting Actress category without either of them winning. Now, I've already covered those films where there were two nominees, but one did win. The link to that video is in the description below. Now, since covering dual nominees in 22 films would likely last over an hour, and there's only so much of me most can take, I've narrowed things down to the 10 films which interested me the most. So let's start with 2018's The Favorite. What's interesting here is that nominees Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz actually had more screen time than leading actress Olivia Colman, who, as we all know, won. This video is not about category fraud. I covered that topic previously, too. So let's just focus on the performances. Of these two, I choose Emma Stone. I actually voted for her at the SAG Awards. I felt she had an edge because her character's connection to Coleman's seemed more integral to the story, as she changed from naivete to Barracuda. She kind of reminded me of someone else. Though my vote goes to Stone, Vice is no slouch here. Both actresses were formidable. In 2008's Doubt, Amy Adams and Viola Davis were nominated for two very different characters. For me, this was no contest. Hands down, Davis deserved not only my vote, but to win the Oscar for basically her one scene in the film, where she played a protective, sort of, mama bear, pleading with Sister Meryl Streep to look the other way because... It's just till June. I don't know too many actors who could steal a scene from Meryl Streep. I couldn't take my eyes off Davis. She was that riveting. Adams, on the other hand, was just okay, probably more because of the role. I know the subject of vote splitting often comes up when two nominees compete from the same film, but I had hoped that that one scene would have done it for Davis. Alas, not that year. Let's go back a few decades to one of my favorite films, 1945's Mildred Pierce, Joan Crawford's only Oscar-winning performance. It's a classic and a guilty pleasure to watch. It had murder, mother-daughter conflict, underage liaisons, which were more graphically depicted in the novel, and a rags to riches triumph, which made the film a critical and box office success. Crawford was fortunate to have two supporting actresses to play off of, and they're both a lot of fun. As Mildred's friend and mentor, Ida, Eve Arden was, well, Eve Arden. Witty. Personally, Vita's convinced me that alligators have the right idea. They eat their young. Sarcastic, longing for a man. Nothing wrong with Arden being Arden, but as wonderful as she was, how did this performance garner an Oscar nomination? And Blythe, on the other hand, gave Vita the right amount of piss and vinegar. She was sweet and light when she wanted something. I've been thinking. What about? I heard you and Wally talking. And a bitch even when she got it. Why do you think I went to all this trouble? Why do you think I want money so badly? It's all right, why? Are you sure you want to know? Yes. But then I'll tell you. With this money, I can get away from you. Though it would have been fascinating to see how the studio's choice for Vita would have played it, I think Blythe held her own with Crawford, and she gets my vote. Throughout the video, I'll let you know the films with two supporting actress nominees that I won't be covering. Here are a few. Working Girl was a film I liked in some parts. Supporting nominees Joan Cusack and Sigourney Weaver were the best things about this 1988 comedy. Playing against what I thought were a stiff leading man and a merely okay leading woman made these supporting nominations even more worthy. Now, had this film been made in the 1940s, Cusack's character might have been played by the previously mentioned Eve Arden. She's funny. She sees what's really going on. There's just not a whole lot of her. 
True, the size of the role is not important. I'm speaking of Cusack's character. She's there to support Griffith, but there's not much about who she is. I was surprised by the nomination. Weaver, on the other hand, displayed comedic chops I didn't think she had. Her Catherine Parker is manipulative, duplicitous, the traits you want in a villain. I think Weaver stole the movie. And I also think she should have won the Oscar. Sigourney Weaver got the best moments in a film that I didn't find all that funny. A few years earlier, 1985's The Color Purple garnered nominations for Margaret Avery and newcomer Oprah Winfrey. As Suge, Avery acquitted herself well, but I wish director Steven Spielberg's first choice for the role had accepted it. As for Winfrey, I thought she was a powerhouse as Sophia. She dominated every scene she was in. For a non-actress, Oprah understood the character. And for those of you thinking, I don't like smaller, subtler performances, not true. You'll see one coming up soon. Oh, Margaret Avery, you got your big film break and an Oscar nomination, but you blew your chances with an obnoxious ad campaign that got royally panned. That left the door open for Winfrey, who should have won. I wasn't going to cover this next film, but I could just see the plethora of comments if I hadn't, so this one's for you. 1950's All About Eve. I did a video on the two competing Best Actress nominees, and a lot of you didn't like my choice. Let's see if I fare any better here. Hint, not likely. I'll just start by saying that I don't understand why either Celeste Holm or Thelma Ritter received Oscar nominations for this film. This will be one of the few instances in this video where I will state that my choice should not have also won the Oscar. Holm, a previous winner, was on a roll. I'll get to that in a minute. And I think she got swept up with the flurry of acting nominations the film received. Yes, she had a good scene with Betty Davis in the cab, but it's Davis's scene. Holmes smiles and laughs a lot, and Karen does fall prey to Eve's backstabbing plot. It just seemed like Holmes was in the background a lot of the 41 minutes she was on screen. Now Ritter, on the other hand, had nine minutes of screen time. Her performance consisted of her usual bon mots. Birdie, hmm? you don't like Eve, do you? You want an argument or an answer? And then she disappeared. I have stated several times on this channel that I felt as though Ritter's role was truncated somehow, that she had more scenes which ended up on the cutting room floor. It's not as though her birdie is a background role. She is Margot Channing's right hand, sorry Eve, but in a flash, she's gone, never to be mentioned again. It's odd. Many of you believe Ritter not only deserved the nomination, but the win. I get it. The love for her is real. Let me say this. Thelma Ritter was the preeminent character actress of the 1950s. She often wasn't given much to do, but she always delivered. Six Oscar nominations is nothing to sneeze at. Now, hate me if you must, but I'm choosing home, though not happily. There are three films that warrant special mention. In 1949, not one, but two films received dual supporting actress nominations. Ethel Barrymore and Ethel Waters were up for Pinky, while, there she is again, Celeste Holm and Elsa Lanchester were nominated for Come to the Stable. This has only happened once so far in Oscar history. And of course, there is 1963, when Tom Jones scored three nominations in this category, the only time that has happened thus far. This isn't the only reason why that particular year was so noteworthy. Check out the video I did, which discussed the supporting actress nominees of 1963 and why they're unusual. Now, if you think Mildred Pierce is my only guilty pleasure with a rocky daughter relationship, think again. 1959's Imitation of Life is the tearjerker to end all tearjerkers. I admit, this one gets me every time it's shown on TCM. The Lana Turner-Sandra D conflict? Yawn. 
Susan Conner and Juanita Moore nailed it in this movie. Director Douglas Sirk was known for his 1950s melodramas, featuring highly dramatic stories and over-the-top and sometimes Oscar-winning performances. He got no less here. He purposely and correctly sublimated Turner and Dee's storyline in order to make the subplot the star of the film. Conner's character, Sarah Jane, is the product of a black mother and a light-skinned black father, making her ethnicity rather ambiguous. Annie, her mother, is a God-fearing saint who always sees the good in people. But her daughter's decision to live a lie causes them both pain. Have you seen this film? Is Sarah Jane's cold treatment of her mother like a stab in the heart? And if by accident we should ever pass on the street, please don't recognize me. Does her mother's acceptance of her daughter's rejection make you cry? I'd like to hold you in my arms once more, like you were still my baby. All right, Mama. All right. Oh, Sarah Jane. Oh, my baby. Susan Conner may have won the Golden Globe, but for me, Juanita Moore took this all the way, or she should have that year. I really wish she had followed in Hattie McDaniel's footsteps. All right, I'm done dabbing my eyes and I'm ready to talk about Nashville. This 1975 film about several dozen characters milling about the country western scene had a very crowded field in the Best Supporting Actress category. At the Golden Globes that year, there were no less than four nominees from this movie, but only two made it at Oscar time. In her only second film, Ronnie Blakely, a singer-songwriter, was able to make a substantial impact amongst the more experienced ensemble cast. As the fragile Barbara Jean, much if not all of her performance was reportedly improvised. I can tell you not all actors can do this, but Blakely did it really well, especially in the infamous breakdown scene. Her co-nominee, Lily Tomlin, made her film debut after primarily being known as a TV comedienne, this time playing a dramatic role as the lonely mother of deaf children. Tomlin received a heap of praise for her performance, mostly singled out by the I'm Easy scene where her soon-to-be lover, Keith Carradine, sings to her. I think Tomlin is a skilled, wonderful comic talent. Her dramatic work is something else. Sorry, but I never got the raves for this performance. To me, she oftentimes came off wooden when trying to be serious. Ronnie Blakely gets my vote, and I wish she had also gotten the gold statue. Before I get to the final two films, here are the remaining ones which won't be covered here, but perhaps I will in the future. 1954's The High and the Mighty was the precursor to Airport, Earthquake, Towering Inferno, and the like featuring an all-star cast that suffered through a series of personal dramas while on board a DC-4 is about to crash. Yes, 1980s airplanes spoof much of this film. Screen veterans Claire Trevor and Jan Sterling each received a supporting actress nomination. Trevor was second billed in the film, even though her role is pretty small, and in her brief screen time, didn't do much that really warranted a nomination. On the other hand, Sterling had a really great Oscar scene, a monologue where she tells her fellow passenger about how she has deceived a nice pen pal romantic love interest into believing she's younger than she really is. As she relates her story, Sterling's character slowly removes her makeup, a less than subtle depiction of how she is stripping off the layers of deception. Yes, it's Oscar bait, no question. That year, Sterling had no chance of getting more votes than Eva Marie Saint and On the Waterfront. However, she did win the Golden Globe for this performance, and she gets love from me as well. We're down to the last one. Any thoughts as to which set of performance I will discuss? Let me digress for one brief moment. I want to say thank you to all who have been a part of this channel. I am grateful for your support. If you would please give a like at the end of the video 
and also become a subscriber if you're not already, you will make this Oscar savant feel like Sally Field. The Bad Seed, the Broadway play made into a 1956 film. I think you all know this one. Sweet Rhoda Penmark, or at least her idiot of a mother thinks she's sweet, wants nothing more than to win a medal at school. Now, what would any strong, determined young girl do to achieve her goal? Well, ask Eileen Heckert, the besotted mother of Rhoda's schoolmate, who, well, let's just say isn't a shoe-in for the medal. This film is great fun to watch, even though it has become campy over the years due to the overly dramatic performance of Nancy Kelly as the mother. To be fair, Kelly originated the role on Broadway, winning a Tony Award, and her theatricality just wasn't toned down for the film. Now that didn't stop Patty McCormick, who was also on Broadway, from giving a really scary performance as the child from hell. And let's not forget Heckert, also reprising her Broadway role, who ended up winning a Golden Globe for this performance. That said, my vote goes to McCormick. I love Heckert and I'm happy she won an Oscar for her wonderful performance in Butterflies Are Free. But I think she's playing to the balcony here. Had McCormick won, she would have bested Patty Duke by becoming the youngest Oscar winner in history. I hate to think how Rhoda would have reacted to, the, to losing. Which of these dueling performances would get your vote and why? I enjoy reading your comments. So until my next video, I leave you with this. What do you give me if I give you a basket of kisses? I'll give you a basket of hugs.